Welcome to the first annual Deer Park Gents Place Cigar Symposium. I'm Frank Athena along with my beautiful wife Kelly. We are the proprietors here and we're very happy and proud to sponsor the Cigar Sensei, Sean Davidson, and this presentation. Please make sure you come visit us here in Deer Park and we will be more than happy to give you a tour of our facility. Take it away, Sean. Thanks, Frank. How you guys doing tonight? Uh, yes, I am Cigar Sensei, uh, better known as Sean Davidson. Um, been smoking cigars since I was about 17. I'm now 28, so not a very long time, but in that decade or so, uh, was smoking faithfully. Uh, got obsessed with it and just uh, was always comparing different cigars, different flavors, different notes. I felt like an old man trapped in a young kid's body. I really did amongst all my friends. Um, as far as a little bit of my background, I have been currently employed and uh, working in partnership with Newman Cigars and more, uh, doing that for about, just about seven years now. Uh, I've been the general manager for the last two years of that establishment. We are a TAA retailer, Tobacconist Association of America. We're a white label Davidoff retailer. Um, we happen to have two different locations, one right around the uh, corner from Deer Park, my friend Frank here uh, in Long Grove, and then our second location being in Libertyville, uh, right off of the main strip, Milwaukee, uh, 21 there. So as far as uh, my education goes with cigars um, in, addition to working in the industry for several years now, there is actually uh, a program that you can go through. It's called Tobacco University. There are different vendors or manufacturers, different cigar makers that will provide this university, this, uh, this online program that you can go through. Uh, you also have different experiences uh, such as going to factories and getting a hands-on experience, walking through the crops, uh, seeing the different curing barns and what all goes into making a cigar before you're enjoying it in your own you know, patio or backyard. Um, as far as uh, 
being able to have the opportunity to go to different conventions and pick the brains of some of the most iconic cigar makers in the industry, it is exactly just that, a huge blessing. Um, we've seen, uh, without naming names, we've seen numerous cigar makers pass away just in the last year. Uh, so it's been very heartbreaking, some of them being you know, some of the godfathers, the dons in this industry. So to see their family take that in, uh, company over, you know, their sons and their daughters, uh, and, and see a multitude of generations coming together to run these cigar empires, if you will, uh, it, it's really mesmerizing. Um, so as far as cigars, I've noticed with, really with coronavirus that We've actually seen a spike in not only cigar sales, but just different uh, inquiries about cigar information, um, more enthusiasts uh, in this kind of field now. And I truly believe it's because whether you're you know, working from home or unfortunately uh, unemployed at home, people are still smoking cigars. People are still drinking alcohol. They're still drinking the bourbon, the whiskey, the scotch. Um, you're having a good day, a cigar helps. You're having a bad day, a cigar helps even more. So I, I always recommend that um, when you're looking at certain industries, you, re you remember that it, it still is a small business, uh, all, all things considered. You do have these huge brick and mortar shops that sell cigars. You do have these massive online vendors that sell cigars um, at, at a cut rate price because you're, you're not being ch uh, charged tobacco tax for the state of Illinois, at least. Um, but when you were looking at a small business, um, it is really, really important to remember that when you're getting the premium cigars that you're getting, if something were to ever happen in shipping, if you were to ever get dry cigars, I don't know if you've ever had experiences with online shopping, it, it can be difficult. Um, and, and that's why I really wanted to step into a brick and mortar opposed to really just being a rep for a different cigar maker. Uh, I think my niche is being on the retail side. Um, I'm definitely face to face and it's been a great experience doing that for seven years now. Um, so let's dive into cigars. Uh, I know there's a wide array of different people that have different familiarities with cigars. Uh, you could be smoking cigars for one year and maybe know just as much as someone that's been smoking cigars for 10 years. Um, so that's kind of why I'm here today uh, is to just educate and teach you some of the do's and don'ts, some of the history. Uh, we're going to talk through briefly uh, the tobacco seedling all the way to the finished product that you would smoke, the duration in which and what goes which uh, in that process. So it's going to be really exciting. I hope you guys are excited as I am. Um, and without further ado, I think we should dive into the construction of a cigar. Uh, so there, you have three parts to a cigar. The three main parts to a cigar, we can look at a better angle over here, if you will. So looking at your cigar, a lot of times people think that it's just a bunch of bound up tobacco and there's no science to it, but there is definitely a Venn diagram, if you will, uh, really to any cigar, whether it be a premium cigar or not. Uh, so looking at the construction of the product, you are going to have the head of the cigar, which is the end that you would put in your mouth and the end that you would cut. And then you have the foot of the cigar. So I always remember it as off with their head when you're cutting a cigar. That's really how I've always remembered this construction because some cigars, uh, different Vitolas, also known as different sizes or shapes, will have maybe a, uh, almost like it looks like a sharpened pencil on either side and it comes to a tapered roll on each side. It can get confusing which side to burn, uh, which side to cut. Sometimes the band on certain cigars is right in the middle and sometimes it's a closed foot. So this side will actually be closed as well. So it can be kind of difficult to remember if it's not so obvious as it is in this example here where you have an open foot and the closed head. Uh, as far as cutting a cigar, just like anything, you have multiple different ways to cut a cigar. The best way to cut a cigar is the way that you most prefer. It all boils down to preference. You will notice a difference with certain types of cuts, uh, but more importantly, it, it, it's really what feels right to you when you're smoking the cigar yourself. So first cutter we're gonna look at is the V cutter. So the V cutter here, you can see it cuts out almost perfect little mouthpiece. Um, with that mouthpiece there, you are going to have a smaller uh, tunnel, if you will, a smaller hole to actually pull through the cigar. 
Um, but it does keep the construction, the cap of the cigar. Versus if I were to cut off the whole end of the cigar with a straight cut, also known as a guillotine cutter, this one specifically is a double guillotine because as you can see, both blades are motionary. Single guillotines are gonna be the cheap ones that have one motionary blade and the other one doesn't move and they break in maybe a month or two if you're lucky. Um, so you can kind of see the different quality and hand craftsmanship that goes into actually making these uh, cutters. If you have larger cigars, generally speaking, what some people like doing is a hole punch. What the hole punch, or also known as a bullet cutter, is going to do is it's going to drill out a perfect little hole in the actual end of the cigar, if you can see that kind of there. So you would just take this here, and that's, that's a sharp blade, and I would just poke it and turn it and pull it out, and it's going to cut off the end of the cigar. Just a circle, though, not the entire integrity, not the entire cap, like the straight cut would do. Um, as far as cutting a cigar, I know that it can get kind of difficult. Um, sometimes we're either drinking, sometimes we're golfing. There's definitely a art form to cigars and activities. Uh, that's some of my favorite time to enjoy a cigar is whether I be uh, barbecuing and actually grilling food. It's one of my all time favorite times to smoke a cigar. It's just on my back patio, grilling some meat, smoking a cigar, sometimes listening to the bears lose. Um, but comes with the territory. Um, so as far as the actual construction, like I said, you have three different parts. The three different parts are gonna be the binder, the wrapper, and the filler. So the wrapper is actually going to be the outer leaf of the cigar, as you can see here again. I'll kind of do a little autopsy here. And then if you're ever looking for a good blade, um, I always trust the best. Uh, one of my local friends here, uh, Gary Hickerson, makes handcrafted blades. My favorite is the one that uses Damascus. Uh, but you can find him at um, Hunt for the Cure Blades, HFC Blades. Um, but let's get into this cigar here. Let's put that beautiful leather sheath away. Looking at this cigar, what you're going to notice is you have, generally speaking, a beautiful, beautiful artistic band to kind of grab your attention. What a lot of people don't know, the band actually serves a purpose to the cigar. The wrapper itself has an end point. There is an end to the leaf. The end is generally bound up with the adhesive of the band. So if you're one of those guys that takes the band off right away, to each their own, uh, but just remember that it's not there just for advertisement. It's actually there to keep that leaf together. So if you ever have a cigar that unravels and that band's not on there, you might now know why. Um, but let's take the band off this one very delicately. So that's your naked cigar. Trick Two, if you uh, are cutting a cigar and you're doing activities, what I was trying to mention earlier is if you take a cutter and you just lay it flat, really anywhere on any surface, uh, most manufacturers have designed it to where the blade is supposed to be strategically distanced from the countertop in the duration that you want to cut. So the length that I actually want to cut should be perfectly wound up just like that. And if you get a good visualization, you can see you're really not cutting much off of that. Some people will cut off, you know, a big honk and chuck. We call those the wood chuckers. Um, you don't want to do that because if you cut past the cap of the cigar, which is generally the last line that you can kind of see on the, on the leaf itself before you cut it, if you cut past that, it's cutting past the cap of the cigar and it will unravel on you. Uh, so I really, really don't recommend doing that. So your outer leaf we've discussed is the wrapper. You're gonna get about 80% of your flavor from the actual wrapper itself. The wrapper happens to be uh, about eight out of 10 times the most expensive part of the actual cigar. This one here is using a Cuban Connecticut seed. So what that basically means is it was a Connecticut shade seed, seed that they took down to uh, Cuba and grew the tobacco there. Sometimes they'll do that in Ecuador, things of that nature as well. Um, so that's your wrapper, that first kind of leaf. You can see it's, ro it's rolled in a barber pole fashion. And you can see when it kind of tears off, it tears off in a barber pole fashion. So now you have what I call the ugly Lincoln log. 
As far as the ugly Lincoln Log is concerned, this part of the cigar now is referred to as the binder of the cigar. The binder's job isn't really to provide too much flavor as much as it is to provide a healthy construction to the cigar to where you're getting a good draw from the product, you're getting a nice even burn, uh, you're not having any issues with really uh, any kind of flavor that would induce from the binder itself. The binder is really for support. You will get some flavor, yes, um, otherwise it'd be essentially useless, but it here. We're going to do it ever, get you back here, I'm sorry, ever so cleanly. And you can see how delicate they are. I mean, yes, the blade is sharp, don't get it wrong. I mean, definitely a nice blade, but it's a very, very brittle wrapper at the same time. So if you can see, you can almost even just pull it apart. But you'll see that the binder is generally kind of a chunk, if you will. So it's kind of a, you know, it's more than one leaf. It's bounded up and it can get kind of messy. But you can see, I mean, perfect example right there. You can see the color difference now. So originally the wrapper was, you know, about the same color as the underbinder, the first binder. So we'll start peeling that off there, get that binder off. And then ladies and gentlemen, that is all filler tobacco. So filler tobacco, when I pull it apart now, you'll see it just all comes apart now. It's almost like layers. Uh, it's called long filler, and long filler is what you find in premium cigars. Long filler tobacco is not the shredded tobacco that will come apart uh, at the foot of the cigar. I'm sorry, the head of the cigar while you're enjoying it. You get a little bit in your mouth. Um, no one really enjoys that. So if you're looking for long filler premium cigars, you won't have that problem. And again, it's just bunches. So they bunch all that tobacco together and they do it strategically. You actually have three different locations to a tobacco plant. The top part of the tobacco plant is going to be Lajero. Then you would have the Seiko, the Viso, and the Velado at the bottom. And when they're filling a uh, actual cigar, where they locate and where they allocate the actual type of tobacco is strategic to what kind of flavor you're gonna get. So they might put spicier tobacco on the very, very center fold of the filler, and then on the outer side, they might have more of a uh, creamy velada. So there really is a science to it. It's not just throwing tobacco up and rolling it up and smoking it and shooting for the stars. But that's your cigar. So what I'd like to really dive into now is as far as the process in which a cigar goes through, all the way from the very first original seed itself. Uh, so if you've ever seen a tobacco seed, um, you would know that it is tiny. It is minuscule in size. So what a lot of these manufacturers will do, these cigar uh, brokers, cigar vendors, manufacturers, they will actually coat these seeds in almost like a clay. Um, that way they're easier to handle when they're shipping them or uh, handling them from the trays to the fields themselves. Uh, so as far as this seed, you would take your tobacco seed and you would generally, if you are a more sophisticated company uh, without putting any names out there, you would put the seed itself in a tray of soil, not directly in the ground, and I'll tell you why in a second, but you would put it in a tray of soil for about two months, just around 60 days, to let that seed grow into a seedling that's gonna be about two inches tall. Now, once you've gone to the seedling and it's been after 60 days, you would take the tray and it's much easier to shake that tray around uh, without damaging any of those vital roots that you're gonna now need to take the seedling and put it in the ground. Um, so if you were to actually in that first process, instead of using a tray, if you were to go directly into the ground, the reason a lot of companies don't like doing that anymore per se is because when you do need to remove that seedling after the first 60 days, now you're digging. Uh, and, and, and the shovels can actually ruin the root systems and you can actually damage a pla uh, plant and there's a, a very large mortality rate to the seedlings uh, to the actual ground crop itself. So a lot of companies like using those trays. Uh, you just shake the tray, boom, beautiful plant. Uh, so they do have these tractors that they'll get on. Now that you have your seedling, 
Uh, it's 60 day year old baby. Um, you're going to take that seedling. You're going to get on a tractor. They have these tractors that are going to have seats and you kind of sit on the seat right next to the tractor and you are just going to start plopping all these seedlings down from a tray. Um, it is a very long process, even with the tractor and the very large uh, tobacco plantations are the ones that have tractors and some don't even like using them because you can ruin the crop itself. Um, so once you plant that tiny little seedling, now you have uh, the, the longest process, which is going to be, you know, the actual uh, mature growth process of the tobacco plant. So depending on what type of tobacco plant it is, meaning what type of seed you used, uh, you have Connecticut seed, which gets its name because it was originated in Connecticut Valley, USA. It's a very mild seed, very creamy. You have Habano, which is going to be more of a medium kind of woody, earthy taste. Um, not too spicy, not really peppery, but just a real kind of woodsy oak finish to it. That's one of my favorites. Uh, then you have the medium plus kind of bodied wrappers, which are going to be like the seeds using uh, Criollo, Corojo, um, even uh, what is it? Uh, some of the Lajero wrappers. Uh, Lajero wrapper, it's going to be the top part of the tobacco plant. Lajero sees the most sunlight, therefore it gets the most the spicy flavor, the, the, the strongest kind of potency to it, if you will. So if you're ever looking at cigars and it says Lajero anywhere on the band, know that it's going to be a strong cigar just because where the plant was located, what part of the plant that tobacco is from. Um, as far as uh, the seedling, it'll take about another two months. So you'll notice we're in the second process. The first process took about two months for the seedling uh, or the seed to become the seedling. Now the seedling will take about another two months to become a fully matured plant, which to me is insane because you have a two inch seedling in 60 days, sometimes 90. You got to keep in mind the weather plays a huge part in this. It's not an indoor growth. It's not necessarily a controlled environment, but they do, you know, have some kind of way of being able to weather chart and things of that nature. Uh, but we'll dive into that later. But as far as the uh, actual plant, uh, what you'll find is that it's 20 million times heavier now in those in those just those last 60 days sometimes 90 days it is now 20 times heavier and it is anywhere from your knee uh, 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 a kneecap height so maybe about two feet three feet all the way up to some of the 10 footers the 12 footers and again it depends on what type of seed you've planted so Connecticut tallest plant you're going to find taller than sunflowers. I mean, they're massive. They hover over me. I'm six, four. Um, some of the smaller plants you're going to see are some of like the Habano plants. Um, some of the, uh, Corojo Sumatras right in the middle, if you will, right around like, you know, a six to eight foot size plant. Um, so once you dive into the harvesting, the harvesting is really interesting because in these 60 days, while those plants have been growing, you have to keep in mind, it's not plant and just sit on your keister. Uh, you have to plant this and you have to be on it constantly. I'm talking just the right amount of water, whether it's natural or man-made water provided, um, just the right amount of temperature, the heat, the humidity index, the heat index, all of these things play a part. So you can have bad years for crop. And, and a company might just be SOL uh, on a fourth of their crop because it just did not pan out. Um, as far as the, uh, the fertilization in those 60 days, uh, granular fertiliza uh, fertilization is most commonly used. Uh, back in the day, one of the big things that made Cuban cigars really infamous, if you will, was the fact that they were using uh, Peruvian guano for the fertilization. So yes, that would be bats from Peru, uh, their fecal matter for the fertilization, which is just, uh, when I say there's a science to it, sometimes I wonder if it's something I could just come up with and it sounds cool, so let's go with it. Um, but granular fertilization, most common. Um, you will find sometimes, what sometimes companies will do is they'll use nitrogen uh, fertilization as a method as well. And that can be difficult because it, it's not as consistent and there's not really, there's still a schedule to it, but the plants, every plant in different sizes is going to react to the nitrogen differently. So um, the fertilization is just a very common way of doing it in those 60 days. 
But uh, after those 60 days, you now have your fully, uh, fully matured and grown plant. And what you're going to start doing is you're going to start the pruning process, uh, pruning and priming. So as far as the pruning process, uh, you're going to kind of start it earlier in the 60 days, but you hit it heavy in the end of the 60 days where you're cutting off all of the smaller leaves, the uh, ugly duckling leaves, the impurities. Um, you'll also find a big flower at the top sometimes of a tobacco plant. And a lot of times you want to cut that flower off quicker than later because it sucks a lot of the nutrients out of the plant because it is relying on all those nutrients. Um, as far as the actual uh, harvesting process, you would start from bottom up. Uh, that would be your priming. You would start with the volato uh, and work your way up to the lajero. Um, takes about five or seven days just to do the priming process, which would be the bottom leaves, like I mentioned. Um, so once they've harvested all of the crop itself, what they're going to do is they're going to take these leaves now to a curing barn. What the curing barn's job is, is very, very simple. But again, there's a science to it still. Uh, so what the curing barn does is you would take all these leaves of tobacco and stack them on each other in these pelones, uh, piles uh, or stacks of sheets of tobacco. Um, once you've stacked that tobacco, you're going to let it sit for a good amount of time. And, and in that process, you're going to assemble a stack and then disassemble this stack. And the weight of the tobacco is actually heating up this stack of tobacco. Its own weight heats it up with the submersion two of movement. Um, and that's actually what's going to cure the tobacco. It's called air curing. Uh, after that process, um, you would hang it. You're hanging it and air curing it. And that's where you're going to get the different coloration schemes. Uh, all tobacco leaves start green. I don't know if you've smoked a green cigar. They exist. It's called candela. It's when you don't ferment or don't really cure a cigar. Um, it just stays its original color of green. Once you've cured a cigar for, and again, just about another two months. After those two months, it can go anywhere from a light tan uh, to a darker tan to a very dark black coloration. And it's all based on your final step, which would be the fermentation, which is making sure that the tobacco, again, is heated up, uh, getting rid of any of the really, especially the ammonia, uh, but again, any of the kind of impurities that are in that tobacco. Um, once you are finished with the fermentation process, now you are going to take that tobacco and you are going to put it in these massive, and when I say massive, I'm talking 200 pound. If you haven't seen 200 pounds of tobacco, the best way to put it is it's about the size, two, two bales would be about the size of a Honda Civic. It's a lot of tobacco and they, uh, they vacuum seal it and it's, it's, just a, it's such an art form, I love it. Um, so what they'll do is they'll sit on those bales. That's one of the other most important parts and we're getting towards the end. The, one of those most important parts is the aging process. If you look at cigars like you were to look at bourbon, like you were to look at whiskey, there's an aging process that brings out flavors that helps with um, the different kind of draw you'd get from a cigar, maybe the draw or the bite from a whiskey or especially a scotch. Um, so there's definitely an aging process that almost every company uses. As far as pricing of cigars, a lot of the times it's going to boil down to really one of two things. One, the abundancy of that tobacco, if it's like a, you know, a mass production cigar, should be around. If it's not a mass produced cigar, you'll start seeing $20 pricing. You'll start seeing $40 pricing for a cigar. Um, keep in mind, some of that might be the state tax. Uh, but as far as the subtotal, even a subtotal for a $25 stick, the average cigar from seed to in your hand sees over 200 pairs of native hands rolling, growing, fermenting, uh, the germination process, everything. So to me, $10, $20, absolutely, absolutely. Should take me about an hour, $20 for an hour of enjoyment, totally get it. Um, but the other thing would be how they do the aging process. 
How long are you aging it? So not just how scarce is the tobacco, but are we talking like two years or are we talking like a full decade or over a decade? Um, there are companies out there that will age for 13 years. It's gonna taste a lot better than a cigar that's two years old. I, I'm, not always, but my experience, yes. That's, that's, that's how it generally is. Um, so once you uh, have it in that bale, it would get sold directly. All, all retailers deal directly. There's not, there are some wholesalers, but you deal directly with the manufacturers. Um, so the whole process can take anywhere between, I don't know, maybe six months, six, seven months, all the way up to six, seven years because of that fermentation process, the aging process. Um, it's really up to the manufacturer, the, the cigar company, what their original idea was, how they wanted to get the blend. Um, so it's, it's a very exciting thing. I, I think it's fascinating to me and that's why I've just grown to love it. Same thing with bourbon. I think there's a huge industry for pairing alcohol with cigars. I think that there is a very distinctive flavor in certain alcohol that I've drank that I enjoy that brings out very distinctive flavors in certain cigars. Uh, and if you don't, if you don't 100% believe me on that, just trial and error. Some of the you know cigars that I smoke, maybe let's say a Padron 5000. It's one of my favorite smokes because it's super affordable, it's super consistent, and it's got great flavor to it. Um, that with like a, a mesquite or an oak finish or kind of that. Uh, wood burning, that wood burning grill flavor uh, from a bourbon. Um, it, I mean, it's like peanut butter and jelly to me. Sometimes I don't like drinking without having a cigar. You know, it's, it's like I'll smoke a cigar without alcohol all the time, but sometimes I don't want to have, uh, you know, a nice pour without a stogie. I mean, it just they go hand in hand. Um, so as far as uh, one other thing that I wanted to talk about was when you get into that fermentation, the fermentation to picks the change in coloration. So a lot of times people will see like Maduro. That is not a type of leaf. It's not a type of seed. It's, it's not a type of wrapper. It's a coloration to a wrapper, but more importantly, it's a process in which that wrapper went through. It was fermented for a longer period of time with much more heat, and it got to a much darker color that they call Maduro. That's why it's called a Maduro cigar. It could be a Habano seed, but it's been through the Maduro process. It could be a Connecticut seed. Usually you won't see it too often, but Connecticut broadleaf can kind of resemble the Maduro coloration. Um, Connecticut shade is what you saw here, that, that kind of on the camera here, you have this light, light tan um, versus other cigars, very oily looking, much darker looking. This is all because of the fermentation, how long it was fermented. Um, and really, uh, as far as growth is concerned, when you're looking at a cigar, what's important, I like to have veins in the cigar personally. I don't want a super polished cigar to where it looks like entirely man-made, um, or I'm sorry, machine-made, but even like you can see this blemish here. I kind of like a little bit of character to the cigar, and I usually kind of give it a little bit of a feel. You don't want to squeeze it, but you can kind of feel if it's got a knot in it or if it's gonna be an easy smoke. And then what I would do is just again, cut her flat, get the perfect cut every single time. And again, it's just that tiny little sliver that you're gonna cut off. So that's really all I gotta to say today. Um, we are gonna have some time in a moment here for a couple Q and A's, live chat. It's a very cool idea, I can't wait, super excited. Uh, but more importantly, we really too wanted to give uh, our sponsors times that really made this possible. Um, just a quick shout out and a quick thanks for everything they've done. So without further ado guys, thank you so much.
Yeah, so there's a, uh, there's a whole concept of, uh, of what it means to be a, a gentleman. Um, and I, I truly believe there's a big difference between a man and a gentle man. And um, with that comes a lot of uh, respect, it comes confidence, and it becomes, uh, th there's a belief um, by the gentleman that when he looks and feels his best, he does his best. And that how he shows up to the world and to himself is his personal brand. And that he needs to manage that brand and find professionals that help him manage that brand. And that's where the gents place comes in is that we help him manage his personal brand so that he can go out and accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Um, I think that's the, the true mark of a gentleman is he wants to be successful, and he is successful, and that has very little to do with money. It has to do with how you show up to your wife, how you show up to your kids um, and your family, how you show up to the business world. And uh, we really feel like we're serving gentlemen, but we're also creating gentlemen as well in the process. Welcome back. Uh, I know we've got some questions here that we've got. Sean's got some answers. Just a quick talk here. Uh, I've seen this presentation a few dozen times now, and I've met with Sean multiple times. It seems that it's changed every time. The amount of knowledge that you have is just amazing. Because it, I, I'm truly impressed with the amount of Cigar aficionado S that you have. Appreciate so, uh, what's some of the questions that you get a lot of at your shop? Yeah, yeah a lot of the times, uh, one of the biggest questions, and we kind of talked about it briefly, was pricing of cigars. A lot of people will see our pricing at different shops and think, you know, why are some cigars five dollars and other cigars are twenty-five dollars? And we mentioned, you know, the scarce amount of tobacco for the $25 cigar versus easily obtainable tobacco for a $5 cigar, the aging process as well. You know, that $25 cigar, odds are, if it's not five years old, I'd be shocked, uh, versus that five year, or the $5 cigar, they may have aged it for maybe a year, maybe. Uh, and, and the age plays a lot of uh, characteristic in the flavor. Another big question would be, you know, especially with these cigar magazines, you have, you know, Cigar Aficionado, Cigar Journal, great magazines. Um, but they're not always a Bible to go off of. So a lot of times people will come into different shops and they'll say, you know, hey, this cigar had the number one rating of the year. I have to try it. This is one of the most opinionated industries I can think of. It really is. Um, there is a broad view of, you know, the science of maybe the strength of the cigar and uh, the, the flavor of the cigar. Um, but again, what I find mild, you might yourself find stronger. Uh, what, what I find full body, but still enjoy, might make you go throw up in a bathroom. I mean, no one knows until you put yourself in that level. And I think it's great to constantly transition and smoke cigars that you've never tried before. That's half the fun. Um, and then one final question I always get is, uh, um, really a toss up is, What's the difference between something like cigar tobacco versus like cigarette tobacco? What's you know, the difference in etiquette between smoking a cigar versus smoking a cigarette? Um, my own mother constantly asking me that question. You know, she just doesn't really understand. And to me, the best analogy I can really come up with is if you've ever been to a wine tasting and you see these people and they'll take sips of wine, sometimes they spit it out in another glass. Sometimes they'll you know, still swallow, but then they get like a uh, cleanser, a palate cleanser really quickly. They're not drinking to uh, get inebriated and get intoxicated and, you know, party. I mean, some are sure, uh, but it, it's a tasting. So, you know, you're there for the flavor and you're not there for necessarily the, uh, the buzz. And that's really to, to me what cigars are uh, versus cigarettes. Cigarettes, I want that fix. I want that nicotine, uh, that nicotine dependency and, you know, versus the flavor of tobacco. There, there's nicotine and cigar tobacco as well but a fraction of the amount there really is even though a cigar is so much larger than an actual cigarette and then you count all the other 7,000 chemicals in a cigarette um, there's not an art form in growing that's broad there's not as uh, much of a beauty in the art form of growing cigar tobacco as there is cigarette tobacco 
I'm smoking a cigar for the flavor, not the buzz. Um, and uh, sometimes it's a mild flavor I'm in the mood for, whether that be in the morning with coffee. Um, it really, again, talking about pairing, it depends on what I drank. It depends on what I'm eating, like red meat. I like a darker cigar with, you know, a good uh, a steak. When it comes to things like chicken, uh, I'll do a milder cigar. And I've noticed that the flavors play nicely. If I do a super strong cigar with chicken, the, the cigar overpowers the chicken. And vice versa. If I smoke a mild cigar with a steak, like a juicy New York strip, generally a nice seasoned steak is going to overpower a mild cigar. So strong cigar with strong food, strong cigar with strong alcohol. Um, me personally, I'm more of a uh, corn and wheat, not so much a rye guy. Um, so there's certain cigars that I think I know off the top of my head, I'm going to smoke with you know, this drink of choice because I know it goes well with corn or wheat versus the rye. So it's, it's trial and error. And that's it's supposed to be fun. It is. I can't tell you how many cigars I've smoked for just three puffs and oh my God, I do not like this cigar. I'm not saying it's a bad cigar, but it is not the cigar for me. So there's, uh, there's definitely opinions. It's opinionated. Some of the questions that we receive is what's the etiquette of the cigar? How, how do you hold a cigar? How do you match a cigar? How do you actually... How do you know you're smoking it right? Exactly. <laughs> How do you not look like an amateur? So, um, it's, it's very simple. It really, really is, and I'm not just saying it. Um, and again, a lot of it is preference. So, you will never see me smoking a cigar. I mean, uh, to me, I just, I hold it kind of between my index uh, and, and my, my middle finger, and... Uh, you want a good grasp on it, but you don't, I mean, it's preference. It's so hard to, it's so hard to explain now that I'm on it. It's preference. I've seen people, you know, especially females more often kind of smoke like this. Um, I've seen people smoke like it's a cigarette and I think it's really weird. Um, but yeah, I kind of just hold it in my index and my, uh, my middle finger there. As far as the uh, actual process of toasting a cigar, cutting it and lighting it, I showed you guys earlier the cutting, um, as far as lighting it, what you would do is you would essentially, after you've cut it, you would toast the cigar so, so lightly before actually starting to take any puffs off the actual cigar. Um, so big difference between something like a torch and a Bic. Uh, torch is gonna just light your cigar much faster. That's, that's just how it is, uh, much more re wind resistant, um, things of like that. But you would toast it so lightly, you'd get a nice kind of black char. Uh, then you would put the cigar in your mouth and continue lighting it while you start puffing on it. And when I mean puffing, what I mean by that is every pull that I take from a cigar is not me inhaling the product. I've inhaled certain cigars. There's also things called like retro inhaling. There's different ways to smoke cigars, but for the normal that, you know, the completely average Joe, um, you're puffing on the cigar and you're getting the flavor in your mouth. You're not really worried about the nicotine and the fix that it's going to give you because it doesn't taste good, in my opinion, really inhaling cigars. Uh, that's not really what they were designed for. Um, as far as ashing a cigar, I've, se I've seen it all. Uh, I guess the number one thing I would tell our viewers not to do is you don't ever want to bang a cigar on an ashtray. I don't know what it is uh, that got that distilled in people's minds, but again, Handmade, uh, room for error. Uh, you can definitely have a tighter wrapper, a more brittle wrapper, a drier wrapper. If you're knocking this thing on the ashtray trying to ash it, you're gonna pop that cigar and it's gonna crack and then you're gonna continue smoking it and you're gonna have all these embers going everywhere. And then if you're me, it's gonna get caught in your beard and then your wife's gonna get mad. And it's just a bad day. So I, I generally recommend that when, when you're smoking a cigar, especially when it comes to ashing it, um, I usually just kind of do circular motions. So if I were to actually have an ashtray, I would just kind of kind of roll the tip of my cigar, if you will, um, in the form of getting that ash off. Sometimes people will tap it. Um, something I like to know too, real quick bit. You know you're smoking a cigar way too fast if when you're ashing it, you have this just massive like red cherry cone. So if I go to like ash a cigar and then there's still this ember that's just this massive red like 
cone on a cigar means you're smoking the cigar way too fast. Uh, the outer tobacco is burning quicker than the internal tobacco. The filler tobacco is burning and it's going to burn uneven and it's not going to, the, the flavor is not going to burn in, in it's not going to taste the way it's supposed to. Uh, so for retrospect, that's a seven inch cigar. Uh, I'm sorry, a six inch cigar, also known as a Toro, means it's a six inch by a 50 ring gauge. Um, so that's very common, you'll see right there. Uh, Robusto is the exact same size, but it's just about an inch shorter is what your Robusto will be. And then Churchill's gonna be the longest. Churchill's gonna be the one where it's just an inch longer than the Toro and that would be the seven inches. So if you're ever going into a cigar shop asking for a Churchill, just know that you're, you're really only asking for an actual size of a cigar. Um, but as far as etiquette, smoking, things like that, I, I don't, I don't want to say there's necessarily an etiquette to how many puffs you're supposed to take, but I generally don't like putting a cigar down. And the main reason I don't like putting a cigar down is it gives it the opportunity to go out. And I've been smoking cigars long enough to know that the more and more that I relight a cigar, the more and more bitter it's going to taste. They're not designed to be relit the next day. They're not designed to be relit really in, you know, even a couple of hours afterwards, if the cigar goes out, I relight it, yes, but I tr really try my damnedest to make sure it doesn't go out on me. What would you consider, is it more of a two-time relight would be about right and then... Yeah, I would say, I mean, it, it happens. Your cigar is going to go out and I would be the last person to say that, I mean, I'm not pompous, I'm not, you know, uh, I'm the kind of guy where if it goes out, I'm going to relight it. It's, it's 15 bucks, it's 20 bucks. I mean, shoot, if it's a $5 cigar, I'm still going to relight it. If I hate the flavor after that though, I know, I, I know why. It's not like I'm, you know, oh, I just don't know what I'm doing wrong. And I know why it tastes bitter, why, you know, it tastes a little more acidic. And there's actually a process in which you can do when you do have that. So if you're actually smoking a cigar currently and you're, let's say you get about halfway through your cigar uh, and it gets really bitter like halfway through, the last thing you're going to want to do is pitch that cigar away. Uh, so there's actually a process in which we would call gassing the cigar. Gassing it is you'd put the cigar in your mouth and you would take a lighter. And as you were to take the lighter and get that burn, you're going to have this blue flame that comes up on it. Instead of taking a draw, instead of taking like a puff on the cigar, you're going to actually blow through the cigar. So that would burn any of the toxins, uh, any of that... Uh, the gross flavor that you would get from the uh, relit cigar itself. It's called gassing it. So you would kind of just get that flame on there, lit, and then blow through the cigar. You don't want to do it when you have ash on it, though. Ash your cigar beforehand. Oh, looks like we have a uh, question. Yes. So is there a certain phase for aging both tobacco in the warehouse and before they're made into cigars and aging cigars themselves as far as a certain time frame where it can peak and then decline. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That excellent question. Oh, that's an amazing question. Um, yeah. So there's definitely uh, a couple different ways to age the, the cigar itself. So some people will age the tobacco before it's actually rolled um, and then roll the cigar and then age it again. Uh, and, you know, I think that might be overkill in some certain senses. I mean, it depends on what the blend is and I'm not a master blender by any means. I wouldn't know what I'm doing creating the cigars. I would just tell you if I liked it or not and maybe some flavors that came to it. Um, but I can definitely say that most commonly the tobacco is aged before it's rolled. Um, then it's rolled and then it would hit the shop. Uh, so I, I typically like to say that six years it's a good rule of thumb, the average six year, you know, four to six years for tobacco growth, or I'm sorry, tobacco age. Um, and then what you can also do too is uh, you can take that product and now take it to your home. And some people, myself included, uh, I'm a cigar smoker, but I'm also a very advent cigar collector. So I have cigars that are constantly being humidified so I can keep them as long as I want. They're never gonna dry out as long as I keep them humidified. Um, one of my oldest cigars is from 1965 and I will never smoke it. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure on my deathbed or something like that. Yes. But you know, it would have to be one hell of a, 
excuse to smoke that cigar, but you can definitely age a cigar for too long as well. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at. You can absolutely age a cigar for too long where you almost lose flavor from the cigar because you sat on it so long. Now, really the only time I, the really only time I see that happen a lot is with milder cigars. So if you have like a Connecticut shade, uh, you know, the milder seeds, the Volato leaves, the Seiko leaves, more of the bottom plant uh, located leaves. If you're aging those, then yes, you're going to notice it's going to not do so much for the cigar in a positive light after about three years. Um, certain cigars, you know, there's certain companies where they age mild cigars for eight years. I don't think it's necessary. I really don't. Um, I think if you age a full body cigar, you're going to get flavors that come out. You're going to get, you know, especially with Lajero tobacco, the different types of tobacco that are spicier. Um, they're just, they're, it's a more oily wrapper. They, they preserve better. They, they just, they age better. Um, but very good question. What are some of the differences between the historical Cuban cigars versus other cigars that are from Nicaragua? or the Dominican Republic, or the United States. What are some of those differences, and is there such a big difference between Cuban cigars versus the rest of the world? Yeah, that's, I, that, I should have known that too. That's uh, number one famous question is, why are Cubans so famous? Um, so Cuban cigars, uh, a very touchy subject, uh, controversial ch subject, but I will say this. Um, about eight out of 10 Cuban cigars, if you're stateside, eight out of 10 that you're smoking are more than likely counterfeit. It is the most counterfeited cigar is the Cuban cigar because uh, these countries, they know that Americans, we want what we can't have. Can't have, you know, there's still an embargo in place. You can go outside of the country and bring back your own uh, Cuban tobacco. You know, you can buy a box, but even sometimes doing that, it's not a guarantee that your product is, you know, uh, certified Cuban tobacco. Um, there are ways to tell uh, that I always try recommending. You know, there's ID numbers on boxes. If you really just compare bands with the real deal, you can kind of tell that it's a knockoff. Um, but as far as the, the, the fame that came with Cuba, it did start back in you know, er, early 1960s, late 1950s, um, where you had Castro come into play and really just nationalize the entire country uh and in doing so he made this very easy choice for all the talent all these families that have been there for generations and it's just it, to me it's just it's despicable and it's really amazing to see how far they've come though um pick up everything and go to countries like nicaragua the dominican republic honduras um, even Venezuela, different parts, different regions of uh, Mexico, different, you know, the San Andreas region of Mexico. Um, it's really cool to see that the talent fled, but it remained the same. So it might not be the same talent making Cuban cigars now, uh, but it's, uh, it's the same talent making cigars that are out of Nicaragua and the DR uh, and Honduras. My all-time favorite blends come out of the DR. Um, I do thoroughly smoke a lot of cigars from Nicaragua as well, but some of my all-time favorite cigars uh, are Toro Fuentes, the Opus X line, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, back in the 60s, there weren't a whole lot of these different third world countries, and some of them aren't third world countries, and they actually hate being called that because it's such an injustice. I mean, Nicaragua, not a third world country at all massively developing country. Is it dangerous in some areas? Sure, yeah, anywhere you go, that's the case. Um, even in the suburbs of Illinois. Uh, but it is a beautiful country and it is filled with a lot of talent that fled and their ancestors fled decades and decades and decades ago because of one person's you know, decision. Um, so they didn't have these countries established back then. So Cuba was on the map for cigars because Cuba was almost this monopoly. There wasn't this huge competition. You did have other cigars being made and you know, premium cigars being made in other countries, but nowhere near the growth that Cuba was seeing so uh, rapidly. And it's, it's true, it's because Cuba at their driest time sees two inches of rainfall a month. And 
that's still a good amount of rain for tobacco. Uh, it's not ideal by any means, but at their all time driest month. And like I said, no one can predict the weather really in part. I mean, you can do weather charting as much as you want, but you can't play God. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to see, you know, the different soil as well. It's a very sandy soil. It's not a, it's not a firm, it's not a, uh, 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 a hard soil. It's a very, very soft, loose, full, full of nutrients. Again, ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's like 60, what? Almost 60 years ago, just about 60 years ago. That's not the case today. Um, there's still premium cigars coming out of Cuba. Yes, there are still Cuban cigars that are like magnifique, you know, you can't even describe. Uh, but living in the U.S., we, we just, the odds of us really getting them aren't that often. Um, you can, but I always tell people, if you get a fake Cuban, if it tastes good, who cares? I don't care where it's coming from. As long as it's a well-rolled cigar, it has a good construction and good flavor to it. Yeah. So I've heard you talk about KFC or Kentucky Fire. Kentucky Fire here, yeah. I've heard you talk about uh, cigars that are rolled in Texas. Should people be, and, and, and you talk about cigars that are from the Southern Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Should people be more concerned about products that are made in the United States? Are they the same quality? Are they the same uh, <coughs> enjoyment factor that you're going to get out of a Southern Hemisphere cigar? Mm -hmm. What What's the, the U.S. role in, in the cigar um, industry? I love that this is an, a great question. I love that this is an opinionated industry because this is the definition of an opinion. My personal opinion is that to have the correct ecosystem, the correct climate, the correct uh, weather for growing tobacco for years on end, it's got to be Southern Hemisphere. Uh, up here, it can be done, and it has been done very successfully in a couple different cases. Um, two things I don't like about it, uh, growing tobacco stateside is stateside prices. They will slap you so quickly because if it is grown here in America, we are going to charge American pricing. Um, I've seen a cigar that should have been, again, opinion, $10 smoke, charging 25 because the cellophane is made in America, uh, the tobacco is all grown in America. Um, it, I hate saying it, but it's, 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 it's cheaper labor. Cost of living is different. It's, it's different worlds. It is totally different worlds. I think that uh, we, are, uh, we are not in the uh, correct ecosystem, and I, I just don't think that, yeah, we'll say, we'll say that. I, I think weather is a big issue for it. Um, and then as far as like you said, KFC, things like that. So Kentucky fire curing, there's different ways to cure a cigar. So you had that curing barn I talked about. Curing barn, you have air curing where you hang it for about 60 days. Fire curing is where you're going to have um, an actual fire, a bonfire, and that you would then put out in a barn and it's going to smoke out this entire barn. And it happens in Kentucky. So it's called Kentucky fire curing. You'll get tourists driving through all the time. Oh my God, you know, Farmer Jones, your barn's on fire. I, I kid you not. And uh, they have to answer these phone calls. I'm like, nah, you know, we're curating tobacco, you know, mind your own, you know, shoot on site if you come on my property kind of thing. But uh, yeah, the last one would be flu curing and flu curing is where you're gonna use that for uh, cigarette tobacco. You wouldn't really use it, uh, more burly tobacco. You wouldn't use it for cigar tobacco. So if you hear that a product is, processed in, in the U.S. Is it more suspect or is it less... Uh, uh, I wouldn't say it's more suspect. I say it... Authentic? I would say it's almost beta phase. I would say it's... Uh, I'm trying to think of a good analogy. It's... Um, I find the U.S. to be very, very good at making trucks. Um, if there was a company that all of a sudden started making pickup trucks... And it was like out of, you know, Eastern Europe or something, you know, somewhere I'd never really heard of, um, or they didn't have the experience. They're in beta phase. So would I necessarily think that that truck's going to be better? Not necessarily. Do I think it should be more? Definitely not. Um, opinion. I stick with Chevy. 
Uh, so yeah, you'd think I would love American tobacco, but um, most the, the the last thing I'll say about that the most the region is for growing tobacco in the U.S. is Connecticut. Uh, Kentucky is more curing the tobacco. Uh, different parts of Pennsylvania. One of my one of the cigars that I did thoroughly enjoy that is all American tobacco is grown by Mennonites in Pennsylvania. I mean that is that is such a cool story to me. Uh, the the background story on some of these cigars is just you could write a whole book on the one journey of. The, the gentleman coming up with the blend, to how he came up with the blend, to the trial and error, to finding the right rollers. I mean, one of my favorite rollers started rolling at 16 years old uh, for Fuente, uh, picked him up, Don Carlos, the Don, the godfather of the, the industry, in my opinion, picked him up from a car wash. He was, he was doing a hand car wash on all these old cars long, 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 long time ago. Uh, and... Don liked the way he was working with his fingers. He was very delicate, drying and waxing and in the spokes of these rims and everything. So he said, you know, have you ever rolled cigars? No. He's been rolling the same cigar, same exact size. He's the only one that rolls it for the company. He's been doing it for like 27 years. That's incredible. I, I mean, it's just, it's such a history. And I never thought I'd be a history buff until it was cigars, I guess. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, well, we are up at time. I want to thank everyone for joining us here. Um, Sean, amazing job. Thank, thank you so, so much for having me, Frank. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, come on by. Make sure you come on by a gent's place in Deer Park. Say hello. It's the uh, best place to get a haircut and shave and even a uh, beer trunk. This is, this is where I get my beard cut, so they got the whole grooming thing, they get you the straight razor, I mean, the, I mean, oh, I didn't trust anybody touching my face, and then I came here, and I'm, I'm, yep. I'm persuaded. <laughs> it is an amazing experience, so come on in, uh, come on over to Newman's and meet Sean if you'd like to get some more knowledge about cigars, buy a couple, and uh, looking forward to seeing you on the future. Have yourselves a good night.